Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Experts Online. Uh, today, we'll talk about the cortical zone using cortical auditory responses in daily clinical practice. But before we get started and I introduce you to our expert, I'd like to go through a few participant tips with you, or like I like to say, helpful hints. Um, first of all, please name yourself as an example, um, your name, organization, country. Um, you can click on your name in the participants panel and click on more to rename yourself. A second helpful hint is uh, to avoid background noise, please mute your microphone if you're not speaking and please mute your phone. Um, for a stable internet connection on your side, we really recommend for you to close all other programs on your device. Um, something that I recently found out um, is if you're having trouble seeing the slides because the participants are in, a, in, in different places on your screen, if you go to the speakers view, um, which is in the right upper corner, as you see from the graphic, you can change the speaker view and that can help you see slides better. And one thing that I'm hoping, um, your comments and questions are always welcome. And I am hoping that you ask questions and give your comments as we go through today. Um, both the expert that I'm gonna introduce and myself welcome questions the whole time as we go through. So with that, I am so excited to um, for today and talking with our expert speaker. Um, my name is Jen Robinson. I'm an audiologist and senior product manager here at Medell. And today with me is a good friend, Daisy Tavora Vieira, who is adjunct professor at the University of Western Australia, head of audiology for Fiona Stanley, Fremantle. Royal Perth and Sir Charles Gardner Hospitals from Perth, Australia. Daisy, welcome. I'm so excited for today. Thank you, Jen. Yes, thank you very much for the invitation. And I do share the same enthusiasm with you. So I think that's going to be a good evening. Um, a good afternoon no, for the Europeans. Um, yeah, I'm very excited to be here. So thank you for the for for the opportunity to share what we have been doing in this area of cortical testing. Yeah, again, thank you for being with us, and thank you all for being with us today. So we have so much to get to today, and I'm excited. So let's get started right away. Um, the first, I, the first question I have, Daisy. Um, in your own words, could you explain to us what you feel cortical measurement is? Sure, that's a, a very good way to start. Let's start with the basics, isn't it? I like that. That's right. Well, you know, Jen, I mean, as you said at the beginning, we know each other for a long time and you know that I use my hands. So you know that usually I struggle with the online presentation. So don't get scared when I do this because that's my way to talk. <laughs> um, before I get into the question, can I just make some disclosure and some acknowledgement if you don't Absolutely. mind? Absolutely. Go so for I'm it. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Two seconds, and that's it. Um, so before we get into the presentation, I would like to disclose, uh, to make some disclosure that uh, I have been working with cortical testing now for a little while, but for the last three years, I was able to put a lot of more time into it. Uh, thanks to Hain Rain Medical Research Foundation uh, that has a funded part of the work that's going to be presented today. I have no other fundings or any other uh, conflict of interest to disclose. And um, secondly, I would like to acknowledge uh, the group of people who have helped somehow at some stage with the the work that I, I, I'm going to present tonight. Well, now getting to your question, cortical response, I think that the, the name tells it all. Cortical means uh, response, 
that's elicited by uh, an acoustic stimuli and the response is from the higher level of the brain from the auditory cortex so you are pretty much kind of in some way evaluating the whole auditory pathway and looking at the very high level of the the auditory cortex and and with regards to that daisy um what do you think makes a cortical measurement special compared to say other objective measurements that are out there that's a, that's a, actually is a very good question, Jen. The, the use of electrophysiology for, um, for, how do I say, for cochlear implant or for amplification is not new, all right? We have been doing this uh, for a long time already. And there are, there are plenty of research, I would say that probably from the 70s, looking at objective measures for verification of a hearing aid fitting for uh, the like determining the dynamic range, electrical dynamic range of cochlear implants. So we can name few of them, for example, if we think about the, the manufacturers, uh, they all use the ECAP and there are extensive research on ECAP, uh, for example, no, for with the purpose of establishing the electrical dynamic, dynamic range for her CI fitting. The issue with, uh, with those measurements is that there is no strong relationship, correlation between the, the subjective T's thresholds or subjective MCLs with the ECAP measurement. And also the relationship between the speech outcome and the ECAP, ECAP measures is quite um, weak, if you like. And all the things have been used, for example, EABR, and then we go into the same issues in terms of uh, poor correlation between EABR thresholds and MCLs and the, and the, the, the behavioral uh, thresholds and MCLs. Things like e, uh, electrical ASSR has been used as well, we know this. And, and I think that one of the objective uh, tools would be the ESRT, for example, that has sh showed uh, a stronger correlation. Uh, the electrical evoked tapid reflex threshold has a better correlation with the behavioral thresholds and uh, uh, me measurements establishing uh, uh, CI map. Mm -hmm. The issue is with ESRT is that you have you don't have a response in approximately 30% of the CI users. So you cannot, it's a really good tool, but you cannot use as a tool to verify the the code, the map that you have created subjectively speaking. And I think that that's what the beauty of cortical, right? Because cortical, if you are using cortical to, how do I put it, Jen? If you are using cortical to verify the map that you created, you are some way verifying the whole auditory pathway. Because if you do have a cortical response, you assume that the cortical, the, the whole auditory pathway is some somehow um, working, right? right. Right. Um, yeah. So I think that is what makes the cortico very, uh, very special if we compare yeah. it with the other. Yeah, to your to your point, it, it seems like the only measure out there that is looking at the whole pathway instead of points of the pathway, so to speak. Yeah, and, obviously, and, and another thing is, 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 is the only measure that actually have been widely studied that actually has a very good correlation with his speech outcome. And also the cortical threshold is strongly correlated with the behavioral threshold. So if we compare it with the other, uh, all the other me objective measurements, probably the cortical is definitely the most reliable and the most useful, let's put it this way. And we'll, we'll get to that in a little, in a little bit uh, with regards to that. Um, a question that I have is, when did you start using corticals in your practice? <laughs> You know this. Uh, you know this answer. As, as, as you said, <laughs> yeah, I do. <laughs> we share. We share. We share this passion. Um, yep. What I'm going to do is I'm going to share a little bit of data with you. We, do, we don't make a presentation. I, I love the fact that you said let's have a conversation, and yep. I really enjoy that. Um, so let's just keep it simple. Let's keep a conversation. Yep. But I will need to show you something else. 
if you give me a couple of seconds. So why all of this is started? So I think that I have to put this on the screen. Um, as, as I said, you know, we remember that we uh, talked about this a um, few times when we met mm -hmm. in different conferences. Yep. So let's get there. And there we go. That's it. Now we are ready. Great. We we have been working. Why 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 cortical? How I start with the whole cortical thing? I think that I need to talk about the single side deafness. That's something that I have been doing for well, over a decade now, right? Um, when we started, Jen, with working with single side deafness, from one of the lessons that we learned from very early on. And one of the questions that we had very early on was, can you have an electrical stimulation and a normal hearing combined? Can the brain actually integrate the two? So this actually was the first question very early on with single side deafness. And a lot of people actually, including myself, was like, hmm, how is this is going to work? So I think that the single side deafness research opened the door for a lot of uh, a, a lot of learning, right? And mm -hmm. um, if we if we look at this screen and, and think about the asymmetrical input that the brain is receiving when we are using um, an implant and and uh, an acoustic hearing, doesn't matter how good the technology is, is it still asymmetrical, right? Mm -hmm. But let's go back to your question. Why I started with cortical? So one of the things that we learned at the beginning was these people are different from the conventional CI users. They are not people who are you are going to switch it on and off they go. They, they go from no hearing to hearing. They need a different assessment protocol. We all agree on that now. They need a different um, auditory training. We all agreed on this now. And what about the mapping? Can you map them in the same way? And uh, I, I never thought that, that was be the case. And I think that is where the electrophysiology came um, for me was, can we actually use um, a cortical measurement to make sure that the map that I'm creating for this patient is providing an input that is as symmetrical as possible to the brain? Mm -hmm. Because what we are trying to eliminate when we um, when we provide the CI is to decrease the asymmetry, right? So mm -hmm. can I think that the cortical would be that's how everything is started with the cortical is that with the single side deafness, if the brain, if the higher level of the brain is receiving these two stimulus which are very different from each other, the same and the same way are we actually providing an input that is symmetrical to the brain? So that's how I started. So I'm going to share a little bit of information with you. So the first thing that we did with, um, with the single side deafness is using the cortical measurement was exactly what I said, was to verify the map that we created based on the traditional method of loudness scale is actually providing the, 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 the input symmetrically to the brain. So we published this back in 2018, it was a pilot study to see if we can use it, if we could use it. And yes, we, we could use it. So the next step was, so what you are seeing on the screen is literally what was what we used. We used acoustic uh, cortical responses um, using the HEAR lab system that a lot of people are aware uh, of. And, um, and we, what we found was that the first question was answered, that yes, we can use this to verify that our map is well uh, created. Then I have to acknowledge uh, my um, one of our PhD students who took this a step further and looked at is the latency different if you compare the normal hearing when you are hearing with the normal hearing, the normal ear compared with the CI, is the latency the same? 
And what he found was that the N1 latency, we are talking about here P1, N1, P2 complex, the N1 latency was not significantly different from each other. Mm -hmm. using four speech tokens. For those who are familiar, uh, what you are seeing on the screen is the, the low frequency mm, uh, t, g, and s. So four different tokens to look at the, the speech spectrum. So he found that the any one latency was similar and the P2 latency was also similar. So what we could conclude from that is that the brain is actually receiving, is detecting the stimuli at the same time. We cannot say that it's symmetrical, but at least we can say that it's at the same time it's happening, at least the detection. We took this a little bit further and we did something more sophisticated where I'm not going to get into details. And again, this was published by uh, Andre Wedkind last year, uh, where we looked at P300, so further and mismatch negativity as well. We look at the scalp distribution to see if there, there was difference. And again, what we found was what you are seeing on the screen. This is the normal hearing and this is the CI. What we found is that the scalp distribution was the wave morphology was very similar. So what, what we think is that the brain is, at least we can say, the brain at higher level of the brain, the process comparing the CI with normal hearing is the same. Mm -hmm. Now, you may be asking, well, I think that the most important question is how this is translated into clinical practice, all right? Because this right. is what it matters. We can say all these, <laughs> <laughs> you can show all these nice pictures and blah, 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 but how this translates into cl clinical practice? So I'm going to share something with you that you can actually now read the paper was published last week. What we did was this is a group of uh, six to seven single side deafness participants. Um, what the question was is subjective mapping. What I'm calling a subjective map is what we all of us as clinicians do is the map that is created based on the subjective input from the patient, the, 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 our old friend, uh, <laughs> loudness scale. All right. So what we did, and Jen, I, I'm, going, I am, I'm, I'm not going to be humble here. I'm going to say we have a really good group of clinicians. I do, do have to, like, they're really amazing. I've met them. They're great. <laughs> they yeah. are very good clinicians. Yeah, they are. And what and, uh, and what we found is that from the six to seven participants who had the map created based on loudness scale, you see on the screen, 66% of them were using a map. And we are talking about people who have been implanted for years. They were, they, they had a cochlear implant map that was not giving them access to every four sounds that we, we uh, tested. This is this is very confronting, I would say, right? Because I'm sure that people in the audience will say, "Well, maybe your team is not as good as you think." And I can tell you, they are pretty good, very good people. Mm -hmm. But listen, I think that there is no surprise here. We know from the hearing aid experience that people will give preference to comfort, and that's that is just life. We are human beings. We are prefer the comfort. So if we are not pushed, we are not going to move forward. All right. So I think that is where the lead physiology came. Um, but let's go back to the question, right? Um, so what you see on the screen here is that subjectively optimized. What I mean by that is that those who we run the cortical test, the test, and they had a response, a cortical response for, every, for all four sounds that I said at the beginning was 35% of them. 66 mm -hmm. did not have a response for at least one speech token. So we were very strict with our criteria. Uh, but then what we did was in acute setting, it means that we didn't give them time to adjust, to prepare anything like that. Mm -hmm. What we did was we modified their map and we ran the cortical again. And what we found is that we was 50-50. We could optimize the map in 50% of them. And what I mean by that, we could run the cortical and then get a response for whole speech tokens. Um, and how this translated into outcome, that's it. 
So as I said, this paper is um, published by Otology and Neurotology last week. So what you see on the screen here, Jen, is that that is the pre-CI, the, the group average pre-CI. Yeah. So 7.9 was the mean. Post-CI, there is no doubt that we did a good job, right? If we were just looking at the functional outcome, there is no discussion that is pretty good, 1.8. But when we optimize them and, and run the cortical again and, and did the speech test again, it dropped even further to 0 0.8 uh, dB SNR. So I think that is a quite convincing that we could improve this, this speech outcome mm -hmm. immediately. They didn't have time to learn or to get used to it. So I think that is pretty convincing that, that uh, um, Cortical measures actually can help us making sure that what the patient is having is actually the best that they can. That at least for the single side deafness that I'm sharing now. And, and Daisy, just to confirm, this was all done in one visit. Right? All done Meaning, in one visit. Yeah. Meaning you, you visit. tested them, you, you made the changes acutely, and then tested them again all at one visit. That's correct. So okay. that is all in one visit. So there's no learning, there is no adjustment, it was right. just cortical mod modification is speech test before and after. So yeah. what I'm going to show you is, of course, I love this, I love this slide, that's the last one. What you see on the screen here, Jenny, is that the four um, top uh, mm -hmm. graphics are the speech sound. So you can see that g, m, t, s. Uh, mm -hmm. for the subjectively. So you can see there is no discussion. It's a very clear P1, N1, P2 complex there for all of them. And these are the subjective all optimized. So those who had a response to begin with, and these are for those who we modified the map and we got a response. So it's a very, it's very visual, although the slide is busy, it's very visual that you have no doubt that uh, the response is there, the P1, N1, N1 P2. Two complexes there. Mm -hmm. Did the, did I answer your question? No, I get a. Yeah, you you did, and and we we have a great question that came in. Um, how long did the adjustments and testing take? Um, if 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 the person is asking about the project per se, remember that of course uh, research always take time, right? Because you have to to follow the protocol. This took approximately. 45 minutes, I would say, uh, and of course, it, and again, depends on the patient, right? Because the test per se, I think that would take probably 20 minutes, but then you adjust and you try again. And uh, so it depends how many times we had to adjust it. Some people you adjusted once, some people had to adjust it three times. So uh, it's, it's variable. Yeah, it was variable. It I, I think to that question, Daisy, um, just uh, to let everyone know, we'll talk about it a little bit more in, in depth in just a little bit here, because there were some other findings that you found with regards to follow-up visits and the impact on follow-up visits, too. That's correct. We, we, so, we definitely will discuss this a little bit later. Um, thank you for your question, and, and please keep asking them as they come up. Um, so Daisy, I, I have a follow-up question, of course, for you. Um, so, mm -hmm. so you started on um, SSD, but you've expanded to using corticals in other populations, correct? Correct, yes. Um, and before you get started, there's one other question in, that's come up. Um, these measurements that you've done so far, these cortical measurements, are these only in adults or did you also do them in children? I, yes, I did do in children. So um, you've done both? Yes. Adults yes. and children. So the, what you are seeing today is only adults. Okay. But um, I have done children. Um, I think that the youngest was approximately two and a half, three years old. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, I'll let you carry on with regards to other populations and using corticals with other populations? <laughs> yeah. Um, if you had asked me this question uh, 
two months ago, I would be like, okay, can you give me another three months? But I think that <laughs> the, very good news, <laughs> the very good news is we do, we did, we did or carry on with a, a large group of um, conventional CI, if you like. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. um, and what we found is amazing. Just give me two yeah. seconds. I will show you. So Yeah, I have to say, when we were uh, preparing for today, I was so excited by this. <laughs> yeah, it is. I mean, of course, I love I love this. Right. So, OK, so what we did from the single side deafness, as I said, we did 67 single side deafness. We moved at the same time we were collecting that with the uh, conventional CI users, the bilateral deaf CI. So what you are having here, and again, you are going to be able to read this paper, um, which is um, it's going to be online, I think, that next week uh, was uh, accepted, the final accepted last week as well. So it's going to be online very soon. So what you are seeing on the screen is the, the what we did. We did 108 adults so it's a pretty decent number we are not talking about six seven participants we're talking about over 100 participants and and what if i i personally think that is why very quite striking and confronting to look at these results because it's very important jane that to emphasize that these patients they are good users mm -hmm. they are people who are actually really happy with their implants they would carry on like this and we would carry on like this if we, if we have never asked the question. So what you are seeing there is that very similar, maybe a little bit less, I don't even remember, but very similar to the single side deafness. What you see is that 39% of, of our patients had cortical response for all speech tokens. 61% did not. What I think that what I use always when I'm talking to anybody about this, I get quite a few questions, is that we are clinicians, we are all clinicians and we do our best, right? We definitely do no discussion about that. But look at what we are missing. So 61% of our patients who are actually happy with the implant, we are not talking about those, we picked those who are struggling or not happy. We're talking about a, a, a research, which means that people who put their hands up and say, well, let's do it. So we found that 61% of them actually did not have a response for at least one speech token. At this point in time, um, Jen, I would like to emphasize that again, we were very strict with our, our criteria. Uh, we considered optimized if they had cortical response for whole for his speech token. We probably, we have learned on the way that maybe we could have been a little bit more flexible and eliminated some, uh, specifically this sound, for example. Um, and then we would have a better result. But we were quite strict and 61% of them did not have um, response. And again, you see there that Around 50% could be optimized, 50% could not. But what is more important is this. So, and I really want to spend time on this um, slide, is that what you are in, in here, the subject seen here is the subjectively optimized versus those who needed some adjustment. Look at their speech score. And we are talking about, we're not even comparing pre or post, not, nothing like that. We're purely looking at the pre-cortical, okay? Mm -hmm. So you can see that if you look at these one who were already optimized, who had a cortical response, these who did not have a cortical response, you can see very clear yep. that the speech score were poor on average. Yep. But most importantly, then what we did was we, we followed the same protocol. So it's acute. There is no time for learning or adapting. We did mm -hmm. the speech test. We did the cortical. We changed the map. And then we repeated mm -hmm. the, the, the speech mm -hmm. test. So this is where we're calling it pre-optimization, which means that it's a pre-cortical measure and post-cortical measure. Yeah. 
So it's... you can see very clear the difference. Mm -hmm. And uh, from memory, I actually would need to go back to the paper myself, but from memory, I think that we had an average 17% improvement. So, of course, what I'm trying to say is that uh, we, we probably are doing, a, we are all doing a really good job, but probably we could do even better uh, if we actually were able to verify our map objectively. And I think that this is the most important slide, but I will share this anyway. Again, these are just the, the, the cortical response for this group. That's the group average uh, mm -hmm. for the, the for those who had a response and this is for those who got a response after the modification of the map. Yeah. Yeah. So I I, I really think that this is very exciting and it's a open Absolutely. a really good possibility for us to do even a better job than what we are currently doing so so looking at this data i mean i think i know the answer to this but i'm going to ask it anyway um which population do you think benefited the most from using these cortical measurements what do you think what would you I'd say? say everybody, but uh, but please give me your thoughts. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, listen, I, I I guess I'm a little bit biased, all right, uh, because of this research and something that we have invested a lot of time. But objectively speaking, everyone, uh, because we talk about objective measures more like thinking about those who cannot help you i actually i'll be very honest with you jen um few years ago when we started talking about this i had comments coming to me say what is actually the point of this all right if your heart old patient is perfect capable to tell you what they can hear they cannot hear and then i would argue back so does your hearing aid user right, right. But you do real ear, ear measurement to, to, to verify. So why we, we don't do any, the same thing with the cochlear? But so going back to your question, I think that um, everyone can benefit. If we think about those who, who actually cannot give us a reliable response for measurements of T's and C's, that's no brainer, right? You don't need to uh, uh, research project to think that is a good idea but anyone who is using an implant if you are able to verify that's the best map that you can create at that time for that patient i think that would benefit um, from it and I, there's just a, a comment in the chat that this measurement is very valid in babies where there's limited measures as we all know absolutely, absolutely. thank you for that comment Okay, all sounds good. Um, who do you think would not benefit from it? Well, who I think that would not benefit from it? I, I cannot think anybody who cannot benefit from it. And, and, and again, I think that depends on what you are trying to discuss in terms of who cannot benefit. Because even if you don't get a response, so imagine that you do someone and you don't get a response, mm -hmm. you cannot say that the person is not benefit from it because you are finding an information that probably will help you, will mm -hmm. guide us in, in our next step, right? We know that cortical response can be absent in neurological issues. Uh, if you don't have the technical expertise to look at the results and get everything ready, depends on the patient age, the state of arousal. So we, we do need, there are a lot of things that we need to take into account when doing these measurements and interpreting it. But mm -hmm. if you have an absent response, it doesn't mean, it does not mean that the person is not benefiting it. I think that's the other way around. He's benefiting the most because then if it doesn't have a court, a court call, response, I can guarantee you that they are not going to have a good speech score. This is for sure. And, um, and then it gives you the tool to say, okay, what, what can I do to help this patient uh, to get something out of his implant? So I, I cannot see, think about anybody who actually would not benefit from it. And to that point, Daisy, I mean, 
as as we've talked over over the year or so, um, there are cases that you have shown me um, of different um, adults that may not be, as you say, as reliable in terms of their behavioral comments back, um, where the cortical measurements for you and your team, it's been very valuable in fitting these individuals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember, I don't know, maybe probably COVID has been two years already. So I would say that would be at least three, four years already when, when we met in a conference and I said, Chen, look at this, what am I getting? Um, yeah, so I was absolutely sure that you would ask me this question because I think that, uh, I, and I think that is the most exciting part for those clinicians who are watching it is, so I did put a, a, a couple of three cases together to share. So if you give me another second, um, I can share. Yeah, that would be great. Um, we have a, another question um, from the audience that, that we'll get to in just a second. Um, as soon as Daisy goes through these cases, um, please keep sending your questions in and uh, I'll let you go through the cases, Daisy. Thank you. Daisy might be frozen. So we have a, there, she's back. Okay, looks like- We lost that you for a second, for a second there. <laughs> yeah, My but apologies. you're back, all good. Okay, okay, so what did I miss? Looking silly. <laughs> Uh, the only thing you missed is I was saying we had a, another question in the chat and I'll uh, um, ask that to you as soon as you go through the cases. Okay. So all good. Okay. Okay. So um, let me see this patient here. Um, if there's anybody from my group, they will recognize this uh, straight away. Um, this is the lady. She has been with us probably 10, 12 years already implanted. Uh, she's a Down syndrome lady that lives independently and um, she's a really good user. And uh, of course, typical Down syndrome, but quite able to communicate reasonably, her, was quite uh, able to communicate quite well what was going on with her implant. That was a very like heartbreaking because this lady suddenly um, had a shoe if they implanted, did not want to use it. So, and was because of ear infection, blah, blah, blah. But to make the story short, when we tried to put the implant back on, we were not getting mm, not what we were used to. And knowing her, we knew exactly what we were going to get. We actually thought. And uh, we were not getting what we expected. And what you had seen on the screen is actually, we did the cortical with her. She's, um, she has deteriorated like majorly uh, the last three, four years cognitively. So now there is a dimension key as well when her communication skill has deteriorated severely. Everybody at the hostel knows her. Um, that was her cortical. You don't need to be a net electrophysiology expert to see that it's just a, a bunch of uh, curves there that means nothing. And we modified the map because just based on the cortical. And this is still not a very nice one, but if you if you look carefully, you can see a very clear um, pill. It's, it's still noisy, but you can see that all, the, all of them are there. So I think that is a perfect uh, example of a really good use of the cortical in the adult population. That is another gentleman as well that I wanted to share. This is a gentleman, 85, a very, um, severe case of dementia those yeah anyway they, 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 that's very similar to the previous slide you can see here that is the map that we created subjectively just based on what he was telling us and this is after the that's, that's the cortical after we modified it again I, I think that you you don't need to be an expert to see a very clear change in the response pattern there Right, I think, and, and I think that um, that's the beauty of it. Um, you don't, you are not relying on these responses that 
really doesn't help you, doesn't really guide you when you get to this stage. That is another person as well here that is even more evident. So that is um, a, a lady who implanted probably six years ago and she had like probably a couple of years after the implant, she deteriorated cognitively very rapidly, actually. Um, really on said dementia, vascular dementia deteriorated very quickly, not able to provide us with a lot of input anymore. And again, this is the pre and this is the post. Very clear. Very clear. Hmm. And Daisy, we, we had a, a couple questions uh, come in. One question with regards to these cases here. What exactly did you change during the objective optimization process in the map and how much did you change? Yeah, that is a very good question. Thanks for asking uh, because we forget these details. Uh, this research was done with um, Medel users. Um, so we only modified the MCLs. We do not touch T's. So what they, 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 they the optimization we're talking about changing MCLs. And I do get this question quite often, how much do you change? Mm -hmm. Depends on the phone, depends. I never go more than 3% at a time. So I go 3% and then I measure it again, another 3% and I measure it again, because you don't want to overstimulate them. Um, and of course you change the electrode that is, uh, that is related to the frequency that you are you are dealing with, right? So you didn't get m sound that these are the electro this frequency band that you are going to adjust. And one thing that uh, it, it it is not your question, but it actually brings to my attention to make a comment that is not only increase. We had few cases, and I wish I I, I had it on the screen, but I don't. Uh, we had a few cases that actually was the other way around. We had patients that we did they were very unhappy and we did the cortical and we had this huge peak and we decreased it and then we had this nice complex and then they were like oh my god you are like it looks like that you are god to me because i have been saying that i'm suffering if it is for a long time nobody cares and blah blah, blah. and with the cortical actually we saw that actually we didn't need to increase it we need to de decrease it mm. wow um, an, another question that's come in, thank you for that. Another question that's come in is, um, first a comment, very interesting, and thanks a lot to you, Daisy. Um, but what are, this, this person was reading my mind, what are the practical limitations in doing cortical response measurements at the clinical level? For example, young children, equipment, so on and so forth. What, what do you think are the practical limitations of doing in cortical measurements yeah, yeah listen you, you are right you are absolutely right um it is with i'm mean, only talking about uh the setup that we used here i would like to because i'm going to share something later on hopefully you ask the question that allows me to do it <laughs> um um you are absolutely right, because when we are using the acoustic uh, cortical response, you are talking about the extra equipment. Um, an extra equipment, you are talking about extra time, you are absolutely right. So if you think for, for us, for example, our group and any my group who are online want to make comments is, 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 is very welcome. Now it's business as usual. Um, it, as research was, was taking us probably 45 minutes, the equipment, sometimes the equipment fail and then you have to start again. So mm -hmm. it was, was not the most practical thing. I agree with you. And mm -hmm. that's something that we have worked on as well to see if we can make it better and more accessible with all this data that you are seeing here. Yes, it is time consuming and is extra equipment. But I guess as a follow-up to that, something else we've talked about, um, but so, so in conversations we've had in the past where um, it may take extra time initially, but what has been your view on how it affects follow-up appointments? 
That's a very good point, and thanks, uh, thanks for bringing it up because uh, I actually forgot. I think that is, is a very, very good point because the time that you invest on, on, on these cortical measures, you are mm -hmm. absolutely right. As I said, it does take time, but it saves you time later on. Because, for example, just imagine a scenario where if you are able to optimize by three months, I don't know, three months, six months, you are able to do cortical and tell Mr. Smith, Mr. Smith, that's what, that's where I would like you to be. Uh, even if you don't like it today, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you progressive maps. We all do this, clinically speaking. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to give you progressive maps and I need you to come back in two months using your number four. Your number four is where your cortical is very clear, very nicely. I need you to build your confidence. And n number four is where you have to be. Mm -hmm. Right. Of course, we are not talking about we, we do have people, for example, that for different reasons start to have uh, non auditory stimulation or discomfort. We are not, we, we are not of course, we are, we are not going to be able to, to, to do that. But what I'm trying to say is that you may save, we have not looked into it research in terms of research. We have not doing cost analysis, anything like that. Mm -hmm. But if we extrapolate a little bit, if you are able to optimize this patient, very early on in the journey, you are going to cut, cut down in the number of uh, appointments for um, adjusting. This is too loud. This is too soft. This is too right. squeaky. This is too echoey. Well, <laughs> you, we do all deal with it and they are back every second week for adjustment. I don't like the sound. Well, if we are able to show them, and that's a very uh, another very interesting comment, is that uh, we use it as even as a counseling because we show them, mm -hmm. listen, you don't like it. Today sounds a little bit too loud, but I can show you on the screen that the brain activity that I'm getting at this level is much nicer. So I need you to build your confidence and get there. It's going to take you a couple of weeks, a couple of months, but we need to get there. So I think mm -hmm. that we have the potential to actually decrease the number of follow-ups to be adjusting the map just based on subjective input. I agree. And, and I, another thing I think um, that um, can also help with overcoming some of these limitations, when we talk about extra equipment, um, I do think Medell has taken this into consideration, you know, this aspect of using extra equipment like, like here lab. And I've got just a, a <coughs> couple um, slides I want to show for some data that's recently come <coughs> out. So if I can get those uh, slides, they're coming right up. So uh, here's one particular study that was released last year on uh, 20 adult CI users. Um, the study showed uh, the feasibility of using electrically evoked clinical auditory potential recordings using Maestro. Um, so this is a validation of the use of Maestro for direct electrical stimulation to obtain cortical measurements. And then uh, another study um, that was recently released in 14 adult MedLCI users um, showed that, as the authors put it, Electrically evoked auditory cortical responses could be elicited by direct intracochlear stimulation using individual fitting parameters, meaning that whatever your fitting parameters were, um, those used fitting parameters could be used to um, obtain electrically evoked auditory cortical responses. And, and Daisy, I believe you've also got some data that's similar to this. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, that's absolutely right. We have published um, these as well. I will show you mm -hmm. quite exciting um, slide. So, There we go. We did, we did publish uh, something uh, on, in these uh, as well, Jen, back into 2021. 
what we did was we did a comparison, uh, comparison between the acoustic and the electrical uh, uh, cortical response. And this is, um, was a quite interesting study, quite nice. And I will show you what we found. So we used um, 20, 20 good users with a nice cortical response from the acoustic testing that mm -hmm. we did. And then we did it again and um, run the electrical evoker that is available on the on the maestro. So I need you. I'm gonna swap between the, sc the screens and show you what you are seeing on the screen now is the cortical using the heel up. So the acoustic uh, cortical response. So you see very nicely your mm -hmm. you want anyone complex there. So what we did was we took these patients and we repeated the cortical, repeated the cortical using the electrically evoked. So we used, for this case, we used the three electrodes, one in the apron, one in the mid, and then another one in the basal region. And this is what we got. So they were perfectly comparable. So what we concluded for that, and again, we used the, 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 the map the map that they had, so we didn't make any change. So what we concluded is that actually we can use the uh, very reliable, very reliably we can use the electrically. So I'm just going to show this again, select the cortical uh, that you saw a few of this slide uh, today. Um, so that's the, the acoustic and then that is the electrical. So nice. yeah, we have done the same and I think that is, is the big plus because you are eliminating a lot of um, uh, problems with the setup, an extra speaker, uh, the, the, the fact that you are, you are connecting, you are using the implant process, so you, do, you are not using the sound process, uh, uh, getting the sound from the speaker and the interference and the delay. And so, yeah, you eliminate, uh, you eliminate, no, you decrease uh, quite significantly the artifact so it's a really good tool definitely so good good um with regards to um this i have just one last question and and please um those of you that have joined us today if you have any um remaining questions please feel free to type that in the chat or raise your hand um, and we'll get right to those. I, I just have one remaining question for you, Daisy. Um, is there any predicting factors that you saw during your work or that your team saw that would help a clinician know when to use a cortical measurement? <laughs> You're very cheeky. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Very cheeky of you, yes. <laughs> there are a few predictors factors, but I'm really gonna need to ask this question, Jane. My apologies, this is a, like a really hard work of a, a current PhD student. She's looking into it. So you are gonna need to wait a few months before so we So we'll, we'll, we'll schedule a follow-up. We, we schedule a follow-up. How does that sound? All right, that sounds great. Um, we have one more uh, question from uh, the audience. Um, how is the correlation between audiometric and objective aided thresholds? The correlation, a threshold. Uh, you are you are asking the the threshold, three future threshold and cortical uh, threshold. Uh, yes. Um, we have not done that because remember that the study that we did was is our MCLs correctly set? Um, I know that with different manufacturers that would be the way to go, but with Medel, because we don't really measure thresholds most of the time, so we have not looking at the correlation, but there are quite few studies uh, looking into with a, with a, with a hearing aids the cortical threshold is strongly correlated with uh, the free field threshold, but we have not um, looked into it in our study. That's a good idea, actually. Yeah. Good study idea. <laughs> well, 
Um, Daisy, it's always a pleasure talking with you. Um, we could, I know, keep going for hours, um, but I appreciate you being here. Um, I appreciate all of you joining us today and um, joining us for our experts online session. I just want to talk about our upcoming experts online, and I'm very excited to announce this. Um, Sound Sensation, the Medell Music Festival, which will be October 6th through 8th. It will celebrate the musical talents of hearing implant users. And for more information about this, um, you can either go to uh, the website listed here or just scan this QR code. It is a virtual festival starring singers and musicians from around the world, all with the one thing in common, a love of music despite their hearing loss. And with specifically the experts online, we will have a special three-part series on Thursday, October 6th, starting off um, with sound and music perception with cochlear implants. And then going into fitting and clinical practice for music. And the next experts online at four o'clock, um, music rehabilitation benefits for pediatric and adult CI users. We're very excited about um, our experts that will be joining us. And we hope that you all are able to join us on for the whole festival from October 6th through 8th but specifically also for the special edition of Experts Online on Thursday, October 6th. Thank you again for joining us today. Have a great day. And Daisy, thank you again for staying up and showing us uh, the exciting data that you're doing and the exciting work. And I look forward to a follow-up next year. Let's do it. Let's book, the, book it in. Great. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks, everyone.